Nobody knows exactly what time the chemical reactions took place and the gas leaked out. And it leaked out over a wide swath, about a kilometer wide. And it swept through the heart of this area, which was then on the outskirts of Bhopal and is now quite in the center. And as it rolled across, it gave zero warning, zero second warning to the people who were trapped. So when we went there almost 24 hours later, almost 24 hours later, they were the dead in their homes, children in their mother's arms. There were buffaloes that were still tied up and they were dead. There were birds that had fallen from where? Pigeons and sparrows that had fallen from the trees because it was a gas which was injurious, which was a killer for all living forms. Hello friends, uh, my name is Abhay Kumar and today we are going to talk about Bhopal gas tragedy incident. We all know that uh, this tragedy took place uh, some 37 years back and this tragedy is known as uh, India's one of the worst uh, industrial uh, accident in which uh, MIC gas uh, leaked and that killed around 15,000 people and it has affected and hit I think 500,000 people. 37 years after this incident, uh, the survivors and the keen of the dead are still waiting to be compensated fairly by the government. And, uh, uh, and, and those who are uh, guilty, those who are responsible for this uh, man-made tragedy is yet to be punished. Uh, uh, our guest today is uh, Dr. John Dayal who was uh, working as a journalist at that time and he was among the first batch of journalists to reach Bhopal. What we are going to do uh, is to ask uh, Dr. John Dayal to tell us the new generations particularly what he saw and what is the lesson we must learn from that great human tragedy. Sir, thank you very much for joining. I don't know if very many discussions have taken place yesterday and today commemorating the anniversary of not one of the, but the biggest industrial civil accident or tragedy, you can call it in the history of the world, outside of a nuclear explosion and outside of acts of war. And I think this has to be remembered because we just cannot afford to forget it for many reasons. The simplest reason is we cannot afford to forget it because it was an industrial accident and current economic progress depends on industries which have all sorts of chemicals, fire hazards, other hazards. Our security, have we learned anything on how to make things secure and safe for people, including COVID, for instance, after all, precautions, lessons learned, lung diseases that took place then. There are many lessons there in the advancement of medication for people suffering from these things. I'll just give you one. Second was, of course, the legislative aspect of it. Regulations, rules, norms. Third would be what civil society apparatus has been set up to bring relief. Fourth could be, what is the legal issue? Reparations, compensation, insurance. Because, you know, as you said, government says about 4,000 were killed. All of us say about 15,000 were killed. And 600,000 were injured. That's 600,000 is six lakhs, more than half a million. But as I put in my Facebook this morning, it was not just the immediate people or those who died within five years or 10 years of the gas tragedy. It was, the impact was so severe that even today, even today, children are born with congenital problems because it, it is still a subject of great medical studies across the world, how MIC and its components that rolled across 
a swath of Bhopal, what impact they had on genes, on chromosomes of the human species. It also has to do with how the corporate sector responds to it, how American, British, European, Japanese companies which do business, we set up factories in India. What is their culpability? Because after all, Union Carbide and the American companies, they gave money, but they can afford to give money. But nobody was punished. Anderson, the head of Union Carbide, escaped. We wanted him as a criminal, as a mass murderer. He escaped, nothing. He was accused in India of manslaughter. And as I mentioned again, the accident and the legal process in India did not shed any glory on India, its courts, its high courts, its Supreme Courts. Because there still is a doubt, did we sell out the victims of Union Carbide in Bhopal? I will take some questions on uh, the government response and failure of judiciary, civil society, government to punish the guilty. But I would ask you to tell more about what did you see when you reached there? Because uh, new generations uh, should know that what has really happened. This took place somewhere on the morning of the third. Nobody knows exactly what time the chemical reactions took place and the gas leaked out. And it leaked out over a wide swath, about a kilometer wide. And it swept through the heart of this area, which was then on the outskirts of Bhopal and is now quite in the center. And as it rolled across, it gave zero warning, zero second warning to the people who were trapped. So when we went there almost 24 hours later, almost 24 hours later, they were the dead in their homes children in their mother's arms. There were buffaloes that were still tied up and they were dead. There were birds that had fallen from where, pigeons and sparrows that had fallen from the trees because it was a gas which was injurious, which was a killer for all living forms. We do not know about the insects, but any living form, even the leaves of trees turned yellow. You can imagine the intensity and it, there was no siren, there was no noise. So nobody knew they died in their sleep. They died in their sleep. And these were the lucky ones, you can say. It was heart rending. We went to the Hamidiya hospital. We went to the morgue. Rajiv Gandhi had just taken over as prime minister. He came a day late. And when he went to see these dead bodies, there was still the gas in that room where the dead bodies were. And he was taken away because his guards, bodyguards were afraid it may impact him. Reporters, a, photo, a woman photographer who was possibly not very strong, she took ill and thereafter she left journalism. You can imagine, it was traumatic. It was traumatic and we had gone there. We didn't even know what was happening. We had gone there as we were carrying our normal kit hoping we'll be there for a day or two days or three days. And then slowly foreign correspondents started coming in and they were coming with gas masks, not like the type that we wear now, but the industrial gas masks, you know, from World War II, which you have in chemical warfare and water, cans of water and stuff of the sort. And in their wake also then came American lawyers. We used to call them vultures who follow ambulances in America, hoping to make a quick buck in, by offering relief to the victims or whatever, and making deals with each other. And then came Anderson. Arjun Singh was the chief minister. And at some stage, we wanted to talk to Anderson. And he was hiding in the urine carbide guest house. So some of us, including me, went there and the guards stopped us. Saab doesn't want to talk to him. I said, what the hell we want to talk to him? So me and some others who were the tall, strong, young people at that time, we broke through the doors and confronted him. They didn't want to talk. Then in the morning, he wanted to 
go to the airport to fly away. And Arjun Singh was facilitating it. We chased them all the way to the airport. But of course he got into his plane and went away. And Arjun Singh had no answers. Rajiv Gandhi's government had no answers. So you can imagine in say half a kilometer, seven, 8,000 bodies lying around, animals, thousands of animals. So, uh, sir, if I have correctly understood you, you are saying that the government was also facilitating the culprit to escape the uh, responsibility. No, we saw it ourselves. We saw it ourselves because the government should have arrested Anderson. He was in Bhopal. He was not hiding in America. He was in Bhopal. Arjun Singh's government could easily have put him up, put two policemen there, and uh, he would have been under arrest. He but it did not happen. Preventive detention could have been done. There were hundreds of other excuses in which people are held captive by the government. They could have done that, but they didn't. They facilitated his fleeing from Bhopal at that time. And, and that's a factor in his, his recorded history. I myself wrote about it. Hundreds of other reporters must have written about it. It must be there. This is before internet, before computers. So maybe you cannot Google it, but it will be there. In the response of uh, local authority, were they active in giving help to people or were they completely absent and nowhere to be seen? We have just, let me just compare it. The COVID tragedy of two years ago and this year. Yeah, last year and this year. Governments are always caught unprepared. And this was an accident which nobody could have predicted, you know. I mean, government should have acted long ago when the city surrounded this plant. The city grew and the plant was in between. And they knew that it was manufacturing dangerous elements for fertilizers, but the in-between chemicals were dangerous chemicals. Methyl isocyanate, all these things are terrible things. So 10 years before the tragedy took place, government should have asked them to remove it, may bring some non-dangerous, non-chemical plant there. Some, rec not reclaiming, some put up some other stores there or whatever, but removed it. And that is too proven for today. When you have industrial enclaves, when you have uh, DIZs, et cetera, et cetera, and then you ensure that they don't have dangerous chemical works there. They don't have explosives in that place because the city will grow. So you put them somewhere where they are far away from habitation. And, and this could have been done there, but when it took place, it was, everybody was totally caught and worse. The only hospital nearby was Ramidia Hospital. And it was overwhelmed, overwhelmed. Nobody knew what these people were dying of. Nobody knew what was the antidote. The only antidote when people are choking is give them oxygen. Nobody knew what was the antidote at that time. So the combination of ignorance, the suddenness, the volume of tragedy, the number of people aggravated the situation. So you have said that uh, those who uh, should have been arrested for uh, this uh, mass murder were facilitated. And I was also reading uh, newspapers and, uh, and there are several stories that survivors are still fighting for very little compensation, but nothing has been done. So why is it happening, sir? No, the, because to begin with, the government of India, which was representing its citizens, did not make a strong enough case in the American courts. The compensation that you could win from there was not enough. The government of India failed in the other courts in ensuring that these people got adequate compensation. So eventually 400 million or whatever was the compensation which was given by Euron Turbine. It should have been 10 times more. And then how much of the money came in what transactions came, what was the later distribution of that money to the people who were concerned. Eventually I think six lakh people got some element of compensation. But the whole process took so long, people lost hope. If it were not for some good human rights activists at the time, professors, scientists, who built up a alignment 
coalition to fight for the rights of the Bhopal gas victims. If it were not for them, this would have been, as we say in Hindi, rafa tafa. Why our leaders were not able to advocate or uh, to put forth the genuine demands of the people who suffered? We are the biggest so and so. We are the biggest because we are the second largest populous country in the world. So we have the largest number of the blind, we have the largest number of the tuberculosis, we have the largest number of bad management, we have the largest number of people in jail. That is not an argument I say, at all. There was Operation Blue Star, Indira Gandhi's assassination. You can imagine, you know, it was all... You also refer to communal rights. No, that's what I'm saying. I was coming, Indira Gandhi's assassination, the massacre of the Sikhs all the way to Bhopal and Bilai, etc. There were Sikh bodies in burning trucks found two months later, three months later, four months later. You know that, or maybe you don't. Because, but, but people who are young then and are old people now know that. So, I, but, but the system should not fail. India is a large country, it's a governance system. It has a steel uh, scaffolding, IAS, IPS, etc., 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 system, we must be able to cope with multiple crises at the same time. We must be able to cope with COVID and with hurricanes and with earthquakes and with climate change all at the same time. You cannot say because it's COVID, we will not fight or help people in hurricanes. So that system failed miserably. System failed miserably. And I think that is something. The government's, uh, what can I say? The government itself was new. Rajiv Gandhi was new. Arjun Singh was there. There were internal struggles in the party. The opposition wasn't very strong. It was also shattered at the assassination of Indra Gandhi and at the massacre. They were trying to apportion blame. And RSS was as much involved in the massacres as anybody else. So the political system was in tatters, you can say. But the system of governance cannot afford to be tattered. And then I come to the more heinous thing, which is not being able to prosecute Union Carbide, Anderson, the share shareholders in America. What does it mean? An American company can outsource or, or place its, uh, its dangerous plants in third world countries and not be liable, not be culpable. Culpability of the shareholders, even if it is limited, of the directors, even if it is limited, is there. They should have been taken to the international courts. They should have been tried all the way up to the Supreme Court and, and lobbied because the courts in America dismissed the Indian petitions. And that is something I hold against America. Just because we were poor, our government was bad, our lawyers were no good, you dismiss our petitions. Don't you see the tragedy? And, and that is what I'm saying. Every year, we must commemorate the Bhopal gas tragedy to remind ourselves of the many issues involved and to remind ourselves what would happen today if it happens. What has happened to those people? Have we given them justice? Now, even issues of compensation, have all claims been settled to the last paisa? Have insurance laws changed? Is there a mass insurance policy of the government in India to help people who are caught and who die or are injured for no fault of theirs? They may not have an insurance policy, but they were sleeping nicely in their beds and they died. So what have been the legislative changes, the industrial changes, the changes in the law relating to public uh, safety network, what has been the scientific issues involved. We have got caught again in COVID because our ICUs are not enough. 40 years later, we haven't even learned how to cope with mass need of gases, of oxygen, mass need of ICUs suddenly. We haven't learned a lesson from Bhopal. Across the years after Nehru's death, I would say 
than any government which came, any political party. Ultimately, their sense, their duty towards the people was not what it should have been. They always had every other issue, but the concern for the common person was not at the level and it's still not at the level it should be. And uh, not only this, but all uh, natural tragedies, man-made tragedies, show to what extent, even when we are forewarned, as in a cyclone, we are not always ready to do what we wish because the rich people are not impacted, they are in big cities. The powerful people take precautions. It's the poor, the outlier, who is the victim. And our concern for the poor, even the just look at the justice system, the, our jails are choking full of the poor, of the minorities, of the Dalits, of the Adivasis. If economic offenses were a criteria, and if millionaires were in jail, I can tell you, conditions in jail would have improved. And that is the main reason why Bhopal Gas, and I think some lawyer should do a PhD on that. Did we follow the legal system, the international jurisprudence to the extent we should have? Did, were we able to use the power of the American judicial system for the good of our people? I think not. We played into the hands of the American corporate sector and they could win. They could shake off the liability, the culpability, the criminal uh, involvement. And they gave a pittance as a relief. You have said that a procedure or a study should be done to, uh, to know and to assess whether the procedure has been followed or not. But when you are you are dealing with toxic materials, why were not those institutions who were involved consulted? So, sir, your take on that? No, my take would be very simple, because when the companies file applications for permissions to set themselves up, they do not give full disclosure. They do not explain intermediate processes, and our licensing systems are not equipped in the forensics of these big industries, you know, whether it is pharmaceutical or it is, uh, but, uh, uh, what are they called, hydrocarbons, or it is these other advanced chemicals, you're not equipped, or, or, or for instance, even in uh, vaccines, even in vaccines, you know, the licensing system, you can imagine they're giving emergency clearance. Either it is dangerous or it is not dangerous. If it is not dangerous, give it a license. If your system can find out if it is dangerous, even an emergency license should not be given. That's the whole point. You can't, this is a science. You can't preempt it, you can't prejudge it. Either it will be so or not so. So in this case, certainly, I think when the company was given a license, I don't think they bothered anything. They were, they were happy that a company was setting up a, 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 a factory in Bhopal, people would get jobs. The MLA would say, an industry has come to my place. You will get, you could be re-elected. The chief minister would be happy. That is the logic by which we go. How do you judge the quality of governance? How do you judge the concern of a government towards the interests of the people? I'm not talking territorial, military, defending the borders, judging the fate of the poor, commitment to removal of poverty, for instance, of a general safety net of insurance, medical aid, preparedness. In those being the biggest country doesn't help us. We are also the country with the largest number of blind people, the largest number of poor people in jail, as I've repeatedly said. So that doesn't mean a thing. I, for me, the litmus test is, is our government deeply concerned without bothering about its own life, about the quality of life of the people? Is it willing to take decisions which may hurt it politically, but which help the people? And in this case, for whatever reason, I don't know if they, they succumbed to the pressure of the corporate sector in America. 
and their friends in India. The case was not fought strong enough. The American corporate sector was not held responsible, not held culpable. They gave a pittance from their tremendous profits and we were satisfied. The Supreme Court also did not cover itself with glory in that issue. Sir, we have seen one political party accusing another political party. We have seen BJP versus Congress. But uh, we have seen uh, uh, in independent India also that tragedy and accidents have happened in all the governments. Uh, corona is a case where the BJP has miserably failed uh, to protect the lives of the people. But we have also seen that how uh, civil society activists were arrested because they were opposing some nuclear laws. So given that grim situation, what is the way out, sir? So that's what I'm saying. If there has been any sucker, if there has been any relief in Bhopal, credit must go to people like Anil Sangopal and others who continue to fight, continue to document without bothering about the media, without on a day to day basis, consistently going with the people, staying with the people, leading their agitations, leading their movements. The Bhopal Gas uh, Victims Association fought a tremendous battle and full credit has not been given to it. The governments, whether they're Congress, whether they're BJP, whether they are JDU, don't want to be criticized. They see civil society not as an associate, not as a friend of the people. They see it as a political enemy. Civil society is not a political enemy of governments. It is a political friend of the people. If the government gives what the people need. Civil society will not oppose it, they will support it. Civil society has brought, despite government's harshness on FCRA, civil society gave food to the people who had lost their jobs and were going back home on the road. Civil society. Sir, sir, sir last, last question. Uh, do you think that uh, the Bhopal tragedy will be the last uh, tragedy in Indian history, our civil society has become vibrant enough to stop it, our institutions have become strong enough. And do you also see um, any hope that those uh, who are survivors and those who are victims of uh, uh, this incident are going to get compensation? Will the government ever be sensitive and will it set up a system where it will prevent something. I don't know whether it's a dam in the Himalayas, whether it is building Chardam Road, whether it is not taking precautions on nuclear plants being set up on the sea, and in fact accusing those who are protesting and putting them in jail or whatever. Government must keep the people's interests at top of everything, not its own electoral interests, not its political interests, not the profits of the corporate sector. And there, I do not think Mr. Narendra Modi's government is sensitive. Where well, I don't think the previous governments were sensitive enough. Current government certainly is not sensitive enough. So have they learned a lesson? No, sir. Has civil society learned a lesson? Civil society was always active within the meager resources it has, the small number of people it has, the constraints it has, the pressure of the government it has, the fear of enforcement director at CBI, IB, police, Thana. Despite all that, if there's anybody showing guts, it is civil society. And therefore, they call it an enemy. Mr. Duval calls it an enemy. Because civil society speaks for the innocent, victimized people of India. The Bhopal gas tragedy people, the people who suffer from natural disasters, the people who suffer, fishermen because of the nuclear water, anybody. The people suffer. The government does not give it enough care as it should. And we have seen that again and again and again and again. Sir, uh, thank you very much. Kindly like share and subscribe our YouTube channel.